Hey there, geometry friends. So as we're going through chapter two right now, we're starting to get closer and closer to proofs and making proofs. So you see a lot of logical reasoning that we're doing now, especially in the last two sections in section two, two and two, three. And then two, four, we're going further. Again, more types of reasoning as we get closer and closer to writing proofs so that we're gonna be awesome at it. Because we want you to think logically too in geometry and not just study shapes. Okay, in section 2.1, which we said we skipped, but we played a little bit in class. That was all about inductive reasoning, trying to come up with an answer based on previous patterns and experiences. Section 2.4 is deductive reasoning, and deductive reasoning is better. It's stronger because your answer, your conclusion is based on facts. So it's always going to be true. As long as the facts are true, your conclusion, your answer is always, always going to be true, as long as the facts are true. So deductive reasoning is going to be one of our main tools for proofs. In order to do proofs, we're going to use facts in geometry that are solid, that are true. And to use those facts, we're going to build proofs. All right. So deductive reasoning is what we're doing. Inductive was 2.1. This is deductive, which is 2.4. Now, there's two big laws that we're going to talk about today in section 2.4. One's called the law of detachment, and the other one's going to be called the law of syllogism. What a weird looking word, syllogism. I'll try to say that a couple of times, syllogism. Strange, strange. But they're very helpful. And believe it or not, even though you've never heard of these before, you use these laws every single day when you make basic decisions. You just didn't realize it. Here's the law of detachment. What the law of detachment does is it gives you one true conditional. And if that conditional really is true, well, the con Conclusion should be true. Okay, let me go further. So for example, if I say, if P then Q, if that's true, then if I throw you an example of the hypothesis, you can say, well, if the original conditional is true, well then this new Q must be true. So basically, if P then Q is true, then if I give you another example of P, for example, like a green P, you can say, well, therefore, if P is true, true, if P then Q is true, then I can give you a different conclusion that will also be true based on the original P goes to Q. Sounds a little strange, right? Once we see some examples, you'll see it make a lot of sense. But again, just to sum up, if I give you a true, if P then true conditional, and I give you the same hypothesis again, you can just give me the conclusion as well, and it will be true if the conditional originally was true. All right, how about a fun one here? What can you conclude from this? If I say given, a student gets an A on a final exam. Okay, so let's identify P's and Q's here. If a student gets an A on a final exam, that's P, then the student will pass the course. That's Q. If P, then Q. If a student gets an A on a final exam, then Q. The student will pass the course. Let's assume that's true. That's a true statement. Now, look what I'm going to give to you. Oh, hello, Mr. Stark. Nice to see you in our notes today. <laughs> That'll happen from time to time. Sometimes you'll see your name in there as an example. Enjoy it. So let's say, so P, if P, then Q. That's a true statement. Now look what I'm going to give you. I'm going to say here, Mr. Stark got an A on his final exam. What did I just give you? I just gave you a version of P, right? And if you know that if P, then Q is true, then if I give you P, you can give me a true conclusion based on what I gave you in the beginning. If you know that any student that gets an A on the final exam will pass the course, then when I say, well, Mr. Stark got an A on his math exam, you can say, well, Mr. Stark will pass the course. Notice what I'm giving you. I'm giving you Q. That's basically what law of detachment says. It starts with a true statement. If P, then Q. And then it'll give you a version of P. Your answer is the conclusion of, well, then Q. If a student gets an A on the final exam, then the student will pass the course. If I say, well, if Mr. Brown got an A on his final exam, then you could say, well, Mr. Brown will pass the course. You're basically taking the if P then Q conditional and coming up with a true conclusion. All right, here's another example. Given, what if you know if a ray divides an angle into two congruent angles. Okay, there's your hypothesis. If P, if an angle 
if a ray divides an angle into two congruent angles, that's basically by definition, then the ray is an angle bisector. There's Q. Okay, let's assume that's a true conditional. If a ray divides an angle into two congruent angles, P, then the ray is an angle bisector, Q. Okay, look what I give you. I'm going to say that ray RS divides the angle ARB so that ARS is congruent to angle SRB. Now, okay, we're talking about angles here. Maybe wouldn't it be helpful if we just draw this so we could see it? Okay, let's do that. Let's say this is A, R, B, and I'm going to draw the ray A, uh, R, S, sorry. Okay, now let's read it again. Ray R, S, I see that there, divides angle A, R, B, that's the whole angle, so that angle A, R, S, this friend, is congruent to angle S, R, B. So I'll make the little congruent signs there. Great. Okay. So, you, again, you started with if P, then Q. That's what you started with. Look at what I'm giving you. What is this purple statement here? Is it P? Is it Q? It's a very long, complicated version of just P. I'm giving you an array that divides the angle into two congruent angles, right? So, if I give you P, what are you going to give me? You should give me Q. Therefore, you can say, well, then, the ray, ray R, S, is, what was the original Q? Is an angle bisector. And that's the law of detachment. I give you a true if P then Q, and if I throw a version of P at you, you just throw me the conclusion. All right, why don't you try one more on your own, friends? Here's number three. Okay, pause the video, try it on your own, and we'll check back and see how you do with detachment. Okay, now this one again is talking about angles. So why don't we draw this? If two angles are adjacent, then they share a common vertex. That makes sense. If we say angle one and angle two here are adjacent, it's because they share this common vertex that's right here. That makes sense. Okay, that's cool. All right, let's take this apart. Ready? Part one if two angles are adjacent, hypothesis, then they share a common vertex, Q. Okay, well, that is true. If two angles are adjacent, like you see in the picture, then they share that common vertex, the red dot. Okay, that's true. Great. So now, look what I throw at you. Angle 1 and angle 2 share a common vertex. Okay, by the law of detachment, if this is P, then you can conclude with a good Q. So can you look back and see? Look at this red underlined statement. Is that P? No, it's not. Can you see that? I thought that was going to be P. But no, that's actually a version of Q. What? Because it says angle 1 and angle 2 share a common vertex. That's Q up here, right? They share a common vertex. Now, detachment only says if I give you P, then you can give me a true Q. It doesn't say anything about Q, give me a true P. Do you remember what that is, folks? If, if P, then Q, if that's the conditional... What is this friend over here? That's right, that's the converse. And a true conditional doesn't always mean you have a true converse, so we don't know for sure. So if I give you Q, the law of detachment is not gonna help you here. So what's your conclusion? None, or no conclusion. Why? Because I didn't give you the P here, I gave you Q. And Q doesn't always lead to P, the converse is not always true. And again, I can show you right over here. I'll draw it off to the side. I'll show you angle one, and I'll show you angle two sharing the same common vertex. Here's one, and then I'm going to see angle two is this whole big angle. Angle two are both angles pretty much added together. So you notice that angle one has that vertex, and the big angle two also has that same vertex. But can you conclude that one and two are adjacent? No, they're not adjacent. Because if you remember the three rules, they have to share a side, which they do right here. They have to share a vertex, which they do. But remember that last part that said that any points in one cannot be in the other angle. And that's not true here. There are points inside the interior of angle one that are also in two. So these are not adjacent angles. So just be careful. Law of detachment, if you have if P then Q, you really have to make sure that the detachment gives you another P 
So you can conclude Q. All right, that's detachment. The other one, it makes a little bit more sense, but it looks a little bit more complicated. How is that possible, Mr. Brown? Here's syllogism. Again, just have fun saying that word, syllogism. What you're going to get is you're going to get a chain of conditionals. I'm going to combine two or more true conditional statements, but they're linked together. So the conclusion of one of the conditionals becomes the starter of the next one, the hypothesis of the next one. These are cool because they just, they just make sense. Watch. If P, then Q. Okay, let's say that's a true conditional. If P, then Q. Let me give you another one. Ready? Here's another conditional. But notice that this new conditional starts with the same letter. The hypothesis now is the same as the conclusion in the last one. So we started with if P then Q. This one says if Q then R. So what can you say? If P then Q, then if Q then R, can you see that we can start all the way back to the beginning? That means if P happens, it goes through R, Q and you end with R. There's your conclusion. That's the law of syllogism. It combines two or more true conditionals that are linked, where, again, the conclusion of one becomes the hypothesis of the next, and it becomes a chain. It's almost like if P, then Q, well, if Q, then R, therefore you can say if P, then R. For example, if I am taller than this person here, and that person is taller than this person, can you see that I am therefore taller than the last person? This is high quality art here, folks. Write this down. I'm going to do a signature autograph because this is going to go on sale. <laughs> but this, this is a great example of syllogism. If I'm taller than that person, and that person is taller than this person, then by syllogism, you can start from the beginning and say, I am therefore taller than this person. And those are true, as long as the first two statements are also true conditionals. Ready? Let's try some. Number one, given. If a figure is a square, there's P, then the figure is a rectangle. Okay, well that is a true statement. We'll learn more about squares and rectangles and their relationships. But then notice what I'm giving you now. In the next one, if a figure is a rectangle, I'm underlining that in yellow-orange again on purpose because that's the same Q that we ended the previous conditional with. Then the figure has four sides. That's different, so I'm going to label that one R. So I have P, Qs, and R. P is a figure is a square, Q is the figure is a rectangle, and R is the figure has four sides. So ready? Okay, the first one is true. If a figure is a square, then it's a rectangle. Next one says, if a figure is a rectangle, then it has four sides. That's also true. So by syllogism, can you combine these into one statement? Can you say that if P, then R? So your conclusion would be, ready? If a figure is a square, go all the way to R. Then it's a rectangle. All right, if it's a rectangle, then it has four sides. Then R, it has four sides. And if you look back at this conclusion, doesn't it make sense? If a figure is a square, then it has four sides. Yes, that is true too. That's syllogism. So again, syllogism starts with two true conditionals and you combine them into one. Remember detachment? Detachment starts with one, with one conditional, and it gives you a piece of a new conditional and you finish it with the true conclusion. So that's the difference between the two of them. You want to do another one? Number two. Try this one. This one's fun. If you do gymnastics, then you are flexible. Okay. Let's say that's true. Cool. How about the next one? If you do ballet, now that's a different one. So I'm going to underline that a different color because we haven't seen that yet then you are flexible. Well, I've seen you are flexible. That was purple, right? So in terms of letters, we'd say if P, then Q. And the next one, because it's a new one, this would be maybe this could be R, and this is Q. Okay, well, let's say the second one is also true. What can you conclude? Oh, but look, do you notice that the conclusion of one of them 
is not the hypothesis of the second one. Oh, interesting. I cannot combine these. By syllogism, it's not going to work. I can't say if P then Q, if Q then R, then P then R, because the hypothesis and the conclusion of both of them don't match. You cannot say, well, then if you do gymnastics, then you do ballet, because that's not really a true statement. So, conclusion? None. You have to make sure. Uh, no conclusion. You have to make sure that the conclusion of one conditional matches the hypothesis of the next one. Ooh, that was a good example. Okay, so make sure the conclusion of one matches the hypothesis of the other one. All right, this is the best. Ready? Let's put both laws together. This is my favorite by far. Ready? Law of detachment plus syllogism. Okay, ready? If you live in Flemington, then you live in New Jersey. If you live in New Jersey, okay, let's keep that purple, then you live in the United States. Okay. Mr. Brown lives in Flemington. Now that's just a piece. So I don't have anything really to underline yet. But can we just take the first two together? Look at this. If you live in Flemington, if P, then you live in New Jersey. That's pretty much true. Well, there's a couple of Flemingtons around the United States, but in general, Flemington, where Mr. Brown does live. If you live in Flemington, you live in New Jersey. Good. And the next conditional, oh, sorry, so that's true. The next conditional, if you live in New Jersey, I'll label that the same Q. Notice that's the hypothesis that matches the previous conclusion. That's huge. So if you live in New Jersey, Q, here comes a new one. Then you live in the U.S. I'll label that R because that's a new one. So just based on that, let's assume again that one's true. If you live in Jersey, you live in the U.S. Can we combine those together? Which law is that? Where you have two true conditionals that you can combine in one? Let's first use syllogism. Syllogism is going to say, if P, then Q, if Q, then R, if P, then R. So you can say, if you live in Flemington, then you live in the United States. So that's going to be my first sort of conclusion, but not the official conclusion yet. This is my pre-conclusion conclusion. All right, now I'm going to say, if you live in Flemington, which is a beautiful city, good schools, a bit far away from school, but whatevs. Then, if P, you can bypass Q and go right to R. Then, you live in the U.S. of A. Good. That's what syllogism gives me. And that's a true statement. Okay. So now we're going to do is going to take that conditional, which is true. And now go back over here. Notice what I give you. I'm giving you a version of P, right? If you live in Flemington, then you live in the U.S. Well, in here, Mr. Brown lives in Flemington. I'm giving you the start of a new one. I'm giving you P. Now, if my statement over here is true, then by detachment... Because I'm giving you a version of P, you can give me a version of Q. Ready? If you live in Flemington, then you live in the U.S. Well, Mr. Brown lives in Flemington. What can you say? Well, final conclusion, Mr. B lives in the U.S. So we use syllogism first to combine and make one statement here. And then we use detachment using that one statement plus a piece of a new statement a new hypothesis, you can give me the final, final conclusion. So that's syllogism followed by a little bit of detachment. <clears throat> there you go, friends. That is, again, deductive reasoning. And that's how we're going to be doing proofs. That if you look at this figure, if you look at this geometric figure, if you see this, then by either law, then you conclude this. Great further work on logical reasoning here, friends. Hopefully your brain is doing okay. Do you miss regular geometry? I kind of do too, and we'll get back to it soon. Great job in section 2.4, friends. I'll see you next time.